يلا نبدا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله All praises are due to Allah the creator the cherisher and the sustainer of this universe and may his peace and blessings be upon his noble prophet Muhammad and his descendants and followers and companions dear respected brothers and sisters Jazakumullah khairan for coming this is the sixth and the last session of Tadabbur Surah Al-Kahf or the pondering uh, of Surah Al-Kahf, the reflections from Surah Al-Kahf. And today's reflection actually is on the verse number 59 that says, وَتِلْكَ الْقُرَىٰ أَهْلَكْنَاهُمْ لَمَّا ظَلَمُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, these are the former communities which we destroyed when they oppressed وَجَعَلْنَا لِمَهْلِكِهِمْ مَوْعِدًا And we set an appointed time for their destruction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about peoples that existed before us and about communities that existed which he destroyed. And the reason why he destroyed them is that they became oppressors. Here in the verse we see وَتِلْكَ الْقُرَىٰ أَهْلَكْنَاهُمْ لَمَّا ظَلَمُوا It means that because they oppressed, they perished. But what does this mean for us? Does it mean that every single community that will oppress will perish? Every single uh, uh, people who will oppress will be, will, will be destroyed? Does it mean that? Uh, what happens to uh, Ad and Thamud? Can it happen to people today who oppress? We don't know. So we need to speak about that. Why do we need to read these lessons and these stories of the people that came before us? If what happens to them may not happen to us or may not happen today, so that, then why are we reading their stories? Also, uh, this is the, I think this is the wrong uh, number of the ayah. فَقُلْنَا قُلْنَا يَا ذَا الْقَرْنَيْنِ إِمَّا أَن تُعَذِّبَ وَإِمَّا أَن تَتَّخِذَ فِيهِمْ حُسْنًا قَالَ أَمَّا مَنْ ظَلَمَ فَسَوْفَ نُعَذِّبُهُ ثُمَّ يُرَدُّ إِلَى رَبِّهِ فَيُعَذِّبُهُ عَذَابًا نُكْرًا وَأَمَّا مَنْ آمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلَهُ جَزَاءً الْحُسْنًا وَسَنَقُولُ لَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِنَا يُسْرًا what, uh, what numbers of this ayah? Can you know? Of the Qarnayn. قلنا يا ذا القرنين. Can one check? Because I think it's, uh, it's not 59. It will be around 90 or 80 something. Can someone check? قلنا يا ذا القرنين إما أن تعذب وإما أن تتخذ فيهم حسنا We said ذو القرنين you may, you may choose to punish or to show kindness. He answered. Allah gave him the ability either to punish the people that he reached or to show them kindness and be nice to them. So what was Dhul Qarnayn's answer? What, is he, what did, he, did he decide to do? To punish them or to show kindness and honor them? He said, we shall punish those who have done evil and when they are returned to their Lord, he will punish them even more severely. While those who believed and did good deeds will have the best of rewards. We shall command them to what is easy for them. So he decided to punish the bad guys and to honor the good guys. This is called what? Justice. Okay? Did anyone find the number of the ayah? Which ayah? Let's speak about Dhul Qarnayn. 86. 86. Okay. So this is called justice. So those verses... The one number 59 and the one number 86, they talk to us about justice and injustice. And how can this affect the welfare of people? That's why we need to speak today about a very important topic. Today's topic is called human values versus divine traditions. Justice is one of the human values. We need to talk about Human values, like justice and other human values, in the light of the divine traditions. As-Sunan al-Ilahiyya. 
What is sunnah ilahiyya? We know sunnah nabawiyya. The sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Does Allah have a sunnah? Yes, Allah has sunnah too. So sunnah ilahiyya is the sunnah of Allah, is the traditions of Allah. Like the sunnah nabawiyya, which is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the things that comes to one's mind when he looks at the, at the uh, communities of non-Muslims today and how uh, developed they are, and then we look at Muslims, cont Muslim countries and communities and see how undeveloped they are. Some people may think and say, oh my God, why, why is this the case with Muslims? Why Allah did this to the Muslims? Why uh, Allah is not allowing the Muslims to develop like others? And people start to actually blame Allah for their own problems. This is something also that can be discussed today. How come non-Muslims who don't know anything about the Sharia, ah, who don't know if the, if the, even the word Sharia ah for them is very negative and they hate it, and who know nothing about Islam, and those who know about Islam, most of them, they know negative things. How come they are so developed? And why Allah is giving them success? Why is Allah giving them success? We need to understand this. This will be answered today, inshallah. <coughs> First, let's talk about as sunan ilahiyya. In the Arabic language, the word sunan ilahiyya means, according to the uh, dictionary of the Arabic language issued by the, uh, 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 the Arab Republic of Egypt, it says, which means it is God's order in his creation. So the, the traditions of Allah means the ways of God in dealing with his creation. Like, we need to understand that the traditions of Allah are two types. Physical traditions and non-physical traditions. Physical traditions, this is one of them. Water, when it's put under temperature and it reaches 100 degrees centigrade, what happens? It boils. So water boils when it's heated. This is a divine tradition. It's a, it's a tradition. It will not change. It will always be like that. It was the same case at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Same case 1,000 years before the Prophet ﷺ. Same case today, same case after 1,000 years from now. It's divine tradition, physical. But this is physical divine tradition. And the issue is, about these physical divine traditions, they are not just constant, they are also very uh, clear and very determined. Which means that if you tell me how much water exactly do you have, and under what temperature exactly are you putting it, I can tell you exactly after how many seconds it will boil. So precisely. So it's so precise. I can't say predictable, it's not prediction. It's, it can be governed by laws of physics. You can develop the mathematics for this and you can have an equation for it. Same, for example, for this. Uh, you know, in every curve uh, uh, in, in the, in the uh, uh, highways, you find, uh, uh, when there's a curve, you find a speed. The safe, the safe speed for this, you know, curve. And it depends on the slope of the, uh, the street. And it depends on the angularity how acute is the angle of the curve? Is the curve wide curve or is it an acute angle? And the center of gravity, so they tell you if you are driving a truck, then your speed should be 70. But if you're driving a limousine car, you can be 90. Why? Because it depends. The, 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 uh, every uh, car and every vehicle has something called the center of gravity. So depending on the slope of the street, depending on the angularity of the curve, and depending on the center of gravity of the car, there is a safe speed for every car, after which the car is in risk of flipping. These are laws of physics. These are divine traditions. 
that are constant and that are regular here in the UK is the same laws of there in, the, in Egypt or in Bangladesh and it's constant it happens since the beginning of time until the end of time it will happen and it's determined so it can be regulated with laws of physics but not every divine tradition is physical some divine traditions are non-physical one of the greatest scholars of divine traditions is called Dr. Abdul Karim Zaidan. He died a few months ago. It was a problem for the Iraqi government because he died in Yemen and they didn't want his corpse to come from Yemen for a janazah in Iraq because they knew that hundreds of thousands will be gathering actually in his janazah. And um, he spoke about, he, he wrote books about the divine traditions. And he said, the divine traditions are the way Allah treats people according to their conduct and according to their actions and according to their beliefs and according to their position from Sharia. Uh, sharia is Allah's law that he sent to us. So according to the position from the Sharia, ah, Allah will also treat us. And Allah spoke about his sunnah in the Quran, in Surah Fatir, verse number 43. فَلَن تَجْدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا وَلَن تَجْدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَحْوِيلًا The Quran says, you will never find any change in God's practice or in God's ways or in God's traditions. These are his traditions. You will not find them changing. You will not find any change in God's practice. You will never find any deviation in his practice. So it, Allah does not deviate in his sunnah, nor he changes it. <coughs> and among his sunnah is this. We said in the beginning of the lecture that... When people become oppressors, they perish. This happened to Adolf Hitler. If you see Adolf Hitler in his, well, during the, the epitome of his reign and the epitome of his, his rule, you could have never imagined his end within a few years. But he perished. Why? Because he is an oppressor. And the whole his whole system perished. Nazi he perished with his Nazism. Same happened to Mussolini with his fascism. Same happened to Stalin. And Stalin was one of the worst oppressors uh, that came in the Soviet Union. At the time of Stalin, nearly one third of the Chechen people were killed and one third were uh, driven out of their homes and sent to Siberia. We're talking about millions of people. And all of those perished with their systems. There's no more communism in the Soviet Union, no fascism, no Nazism. So this is a divine tradition. When people become oppressors, they perish. Are there oppressors today? There are oppressors. Can we say that they will perish? It's our aqidah. We have to believe that they will perish. They have to perish. Because Allah, Allah's sunnah does not change and does not deviate. Okay, when will they perish? Allahu a'lam. I cannot tell you after how many seconds, after how many days, like how many, I cannot. It's not like a physical. This is the difference between physical traditions like the boiling of water that I can regulate with physical laws, laws of physics, and the traditions that are non-physical that cannot be regulated. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَتِلْكَ الْقُرَىٰ أَهْلَكْنَاهُمْ لَمَّا ظَلَمُوا وَجَعَلْنَا لِمَهْلِكِهِمْ مَوْعِدًا The former communities, we destroyed them when they oppressed and we set appointed time for their destruction. So the time of their destruction is known by Allah. Why? Because you cannot regulate it physically. It's not physics. 
And there's a lot of variables. To what extent are they uh, uh, oppressors? That's a variable. Are they oppressing their people or are their people oppressing with them? That's also another variable. How are they oppressing? Are they just corrupt and they steal the money? Or are they corrupt and they jail people? Or are they corrupt and jail and kill? Or are they corrupt and jail and kill and burn? So there's a lot of variables. So you cannot regulate it with laws of physics. So this is the difference between something physical, tradition of Allah, and something non-physical. We as Muslims believe that both happens. But the physical ones, Allah gave us the ability to regulate it through the laws of physics and develop the mathematics for it and develop equations. But the non-physical, we don't have equations. Allah said that he, has the, the, he appointed a time for it to happen. So it's constant and regular, but it's not determined like the physical uh, traditions. Physical traditions are constant, regular, and determined. These are constant, regular, but not determined. And because they are constant and regular, there's a point of telling us, travel around the world and look at the former communities and what happened to them to take lessons. Because had it not been regular, had it not been constant, then there is no point of looking at the old nations and see because if Allah doesn't have, or if Allah changes his sunnah, then there is no point of looking at the former communities at all. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said several times in the Quran, tens of times, قُلْ سِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَانْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبُونَ ثُمَّ انْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبُتُ الْمُكَذِّبِينَ Say, travel throughout the earth and see what fate befell those who rejected the truth. Why do we need to see that? Because Allah's tradition does not change. Same. قُلْ سِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَانْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الْمُجْرِمِينَ in Surah Al-Naml. Say, travel throughout the earth and see what fate befell the criminals. So, again, the divine traditions are constant, are regular, are general. They are not, they are not determined if they are not physical, but they are general. They do not apply on specific individuals, on all people. That's why Allah told us to look at the former communities. For example, when Allah told us uh, in Surah Al-Jum'ah, uh, the example of those who uh, were given the Torah and they did not apply it is like a donkey carrying books on its back. This is not for us to laugh at them. It's for us to know that if we also are, give, if we are given the Quran and we don't apply it, then we will not become deer, we will become donkeys too, actually. So this is something so important for us to understand. These stories is because Allah is giving us examples that we need to benefit from in order to avoid those people's mistakes. But if we don't avoid their mistakes, we become, we will be facing the same fate. So had it not been constant, and regular and general, then there could have been no point in mentioning the stories of the perished communities. Now we spoke about the divine traditions. Let's now forget about the divine traditions and speak a little bit about the values. Al Qiyam. The word value. means what worth. The value of something is what it worth. And some people mix between valuable and expensive. Valuable doesn't mean expensive. Valuable means something that worth its price. It's valuable. Expensing, expensive is something that doesn't worth its price.
There is also valuable manners, valuable conduct, things like justice, things like equality, things like self-development. These are valuable manners. It's manners. Being valuable means that it is worth the sacrifice for it, to have it in our community. It's a manner which benefits the individual and the society, and the benefits of these manners are greater than the price paid for them, than the sacrifice done to achieve it, or made to achieve it. All Greek philosophers spoke about the values. And they said that there are three main values under which all the other values can be coming after the, under them. So those are, they call it the transcendentals, which is the universal values. And those three are kalon agathou aletheia in Greek, which means beauty, goodness, and truth. And they said every single value comes under this, is a, actually a, a, a sub-value of these three values. Al-haqqu, al-khayru, al-jamal. Truth, goodness, and, or good, and beauty. So whether the values are truthfulness, uh, mercy, justice, equality, bravery, sincerity, working hard, self-development, all of these, they come under one of these uh, transcendentals. In the Islamic thinking, Islamic thinkers spoke a lot about values too. <coughs> they did not call it values, but they called it manners. So there is a lot of books written by old Islamic thinkers like Ibn Maskawi and Al-Ghazali about values. And they called it akhlaq. Akhlaq. Tahdeeb al-akhlaq. Or disciplining oneself. Or disciplining one manners. And they divided it into good and hideous akhlaq. Good akhlaq and hideous akhlaq. Al-Hasan wal-Qabih. In Islamic thinking, the source of values is what? Do you know what's the source of the Islamic values in Islam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the source of our values. If we talk about the transcendentals, al-haqq wal khayr wal jamal, Allah, one of his names is al-haqq. And he mentioned the word al-haqq in the Quran 176 times. فَتَعَالَ اللَّهُ الْمَلِكُ الْحَقِّ Exalted be God, the King, the Truth. وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ بِالْحَقِّ We sent to you the scripture with truth. خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ بِالْحَقِّ He created the heavens and the earth with the truth. So Allah mentioned the truth, which is one of the transcendentals, one of the main universal values, 176 times in the Quran. Al-Khayr, good, is mentioned in the Quran 174 times. Fastabiqul khayrat, raised to good. Ulaika yusari'una fil khayrat, are the ones who raise toward good things. Allah, this is in Surah Al-Mu'minun. Allah is actually describing the Mu'mineen, describing the believers. And he's saying those are the ones who raise toward good things. And Allah said, be a community that calls for what is good. So Allah mentioned Al-Khayr, which is one of the transcendentals, one of the universal values, 174 times. Al-Jamal, beauty. Allah mentioned beauty a lot. Directly and indirectly. Directly, فَصْبِرْ sabran jamila. So practice beautiful patience. 
وهجرهم هجرا جميلا ignore them politely which means beautifully جميلا beautifully فصح الصفحة الجميل bear with them graciously beautifully الجميل beautifully even one of the names of Allah is the beautiful إن الله جميل يحب الجمال this is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty so one of the names of Allah is the beautiful you will tell me it's not one of the 99 names people think mistakenly that Allah has only 99 names that's not true the hadith says that Allah has 99 names the one who understands them and lives by their meanings will go to paradise. This doesn't mean that he has 99 names. It means that among his names there are 99 that are so important to be understood and to live by their meanings. Which names are these? We don't know. So you have to study all the names of Allah. And then in the same hadith, there are 99 names that are mentioned, but they are not the words of the Prophet ﷺ. This is ijtihad. This is a, a, a some uh, um, it's the opinion of the narrator of the hadith but it's not the words of the Prophet Allah, the Prophet Sallam did not tell us which 99 names he left us like that he told us among the names of Allah which people counted they found more than 300 there are 99 that are so important which are these? we don't know study all of them try to live by all of them among his names is the beautiful. Inna Allah jamilun yuhibbu al-jamal. Anything ugly is against Allah. Against Allah's way. Against Allah's traditions. Allah spoke about beauty indirectly in these verses. Sun'a Allah alladhi atqana kulla shay. The creation of Allah who perfected everything. You feel the beauty in the verse without mentioning the word beautiful. The perfection of the creation of Allah. Perfection is one of the values. It comes as a subsidiary of beauty. If we consider beauty is the transcendental, is one of the universal values, then perfection will come under the category of beauty. We will show them our signs in the distant regions and in themselves. You feel the beauty without mentioning the word beautiful at all. Allah is describing the human being, the human face, saying, did we not give him eyes, a tongue and two lips? Subhanallah, you feel the beauty without mentioning the word beautiful. The goal of these human values is to make life better and make it more positive. Whether these values are mentioned in the Islamic thinking and in our books or outside or with the, in the Greek uh, philosophers' books, these values are important and it is very positive. The Prophet ﷺ gathered the Sahaba one day and he asked them. This hadith is narrated by Abu Huraira. The Prophet said, Man azbaha minkum sa'ima. Who among you woke up today with the intention that he is fasting? Abu Bakr said, I am. So the Prophet asked, Who among you followed a janazah to its burial today? <coughs> Abu Bakr said, I am. And then the Prophet asked, فَمَنْ أَطْعَمَ مِنْكُمُ الْيَوْمَ مِسْكِينًا And who among you fed a poor person today? Abu Bakr said, I am. And then the Prophet asked, فَمَنْ عَادَ مِنْكُمُ الْيَوْمَ مَرِيضًا Who revisited a, an ill person today? The word عَادَ, مَرِيض, means the sunnah of the Prophet or what we are uh, supposed to do. People think that it's... Uh, we should visit the, the, the ill people. No. Iyadat al marid means to revisit. Ya'udu. To revisit. When someone is ill, 
For three months, you don't go and see him once. You keep visiting him like every day, twice a week, once a week, but you, you revisit. Not just once. Abu Bakr said, I am. So the Prophet ﷺ said, These things will not gather in someone except if he goes to paradise. What are these things? Janaza? What are these things? If you look at what the Prophet is speaking, the Prophet is speaking about values. What makes Abu Bakr wake up fasting? And what makes him follow a janazah to its burial? What makes him feed a poor person? What makes him revisit a, a, a patient? It is the values of being thankful. It's the values of fidelity, values of mercy, values of loyalty. These are human values. So the Prophet is speaking about these values. If they gather in someone, he goes to Jannah. It's the values. These values motivate people to do actions like this. So it's all about the values. We focus a lot on the actions. We focused a lot on the actions of the, uh, uh, the French cartoonists. These actions are the outcome of the values. We should focus on the values. You want to change them? You cannot change their actions. Change their values. Okay. Now we spoke about the values in Islamic thinking. And we said that in Islam, the source of the values is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, but we see a lot of people who have no faith around us and they have good values too. We see a lot of atheists who have good values too. What is the source of their values? They don't have Allah. They don't believe in Allah. They do not read the Quran. What is the source of their values? <coughs> if you ask them, they tell you science. For them, they try always to, if you ask them about any source, they tell you science. Which is not true. Because science cannot tell you, be a source of values. Uh, for example, scientifically, the scientists of Adolf Hitler who burned millions of Jews uh, gypsies well, not only Jews gypsies, Russians, Belarusians all those people that were oppressed and they were burned in the Holocaust scientifically they were perfect why? because they used the least amount of gas to kill as many people as possible. So scientifically, they are okay. Science cannot say that they are wrong. Science says actually they are perfect because they did not actually um, use more gas than needed. But everybody knows that what they did is hideous. What they did is a crime. So science cannot be a source ever of values. Science cannot tell you what is morally right and morally wrong. Science can tell you what's scientifically right and scientifically wrong, but not morally right and morally wrong. Allah tells us in the Quran. This is the natural disposition God instilled in mankind. Allah instilled in us the innate nature so whether one is Muslim or not, innate nature tells him what is morally right and morally wrong. So the source of values of any human being is the fitrah, the innate nature that Allah instilled in every one of us. Religion comes to enforce these values and to strengthen them. And the more people go far from the religion, the weaker they become in values. But it weakens, but it doesn't disappear. The Islamic thinking did not really focus a lot on the values, 
because he, he considers it like a foregone conclusion. It's granted, it's something normal. But the Islamic thinking focused a lot on how the Sharia will grant it for people. So these values are human rights, actually, should be granted for people. For example, among the human values is what? al hurriya freedom. Freedom is one of the human values. One of the ways Allah described Prophet Muhammad in the Quran is that he is a liberator. Allah said in Surah Al-A'raf, الذين يتبعون الرسول النبي الامي الذي يجدونه مكتوبا عندهم في التوراة والانجيل يأمرهم بالمعروف وينهاهم عن المنكر ويحل لهم الطيبات ويحرم عليهم الخبائث ويضع عنهم اسرهم والاغلال التي كانت عليهم الله هير از ديسكرايبينج ذا بروفيت محمد از منشن ان ذا تورا اند ان ذا جوسبل اند هي از دوينج سو اند سو اند سو اند ذن الله سيز اند هي بريكس ذير تشينز اند ريموفز ذير بيردن فروم ذير فروم ذيم So the Prophet is mentioned as someone who liberates people, who breaks their chains. He's the liberator. Liberty is one of the human values. And at the same time, it's a human right according to the Quran. Listen to this. This is amazing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the atonement that one can seek if he kills someone by mistake. In Islam, killing someone is a hideous crime. It's a It's a very terrible crime. Killing one person in Islam unjustly is like killing the whole mankind. But you can kill someone by mistake, in an accident, accidentally. What can you do to seek atonement from Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no believer can kill a believer except by accident. And if you kill a believer by accident, free a slave. If you take life from someone by mistake, to seek atonement, give life to someone dead. How can I give life to someone dead? Allah says, give freedom to someone deprived from freedom. So in Islam, freedom equals life. Freedom equals life. You kill someone by mistake, free a slave. This is how the Sharia focused on human values. It granted that to people. And this changed. Changed people. Islam is a revolution. Islam is a revolution. It did not come just to change people's beliefs. To make them stop worshipping idols. No. It came to cause a, a whole paradigm shift. Regarding how they deal with Allah. And how they deal with each other. And how they view each other. <coughs> look at the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, how they looked at themselves and how they looked at others. When a Bedouin called Rib'i ibn Amr, Rib'i ibn Amr was a Bedouin, a companion of the Prophet, but he was a Bedouin, very primitive people. When he, was, when he went to speak to Rustum, the leader of the Persian army before the battle between the Muslims and the Persians. Rustam told him, who are you? Who are you guys coming from Arabia? Do you know who we are? We are a civilization of 2,000 years. Who are you? Look at how he described themselves, himself. He said, we are people whom Allah have sent. لِنُخْرِجَ الْعِبَادِ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ الْعِبَادِ To get people out from the worship of creation to the worship of the creator and from the tightness of this life to the vastness of the hereafter and from the oppression focus on this and to get people out from the oppression of man-made religions to the justice of Islam. So he looked at himself, not as someone going to kill non-Muslims, but rather someone is going to liberate non-Muslims by getting them out from the darkness of man-made religions to the light of Islam. Not by force, but by spreading the word. This is Rib'i ibn Amr. So those Sahaba looked at themselves as liberators of non-Muslims. 
This is how liberty lies in the Islamic thinking. Look at Umar ibn al-Khattab. When the Christian Egyptian came complaining to him from the son of Amr ibn al-As, the ruler of Egypt, his son was racing with some Egyptians, Copts, um, Christian Copts. And one of them won the race. So there was a fight. And during the fight, the, uh, the son of Amr ibn al-As beat the Copt and told him, how come you win the, the, the son of the two noble people? His mother and father are from Quraysh, are Arabs. So the Christian took his mule and he traveled all the way to Medina to complain and file a claim against the son of Amr ibn al-As, the son of the ruler of Egypt. Umar ibn al-Khattab brought both. Amr ibn al-As, the ruler, and his son. His son confessed. He said, yes, I lost my mind and I lost my temper and uh, I, I beat him up. So Amr ibn al-Khattab said, okay, then Sharia has to take place. And he gave his uh, wooden stick to the uh, copt and he told him to beat up the son of the two noble people. And he beat him up. And then he told him, beat up his father, the ruler of Egypt, a companion of the Prophet So the copt said, no, I, I took my revenge. So Omar said, no, he didn't take your revenge yet. He could have never done that to you without the support of his father. And then he looked at the father and he told him, when did you start enslaving free people? Which means we came to free the slaves. How come you are enslaving free people? This is how the first generation, the students of the Prophet looked at themselves as liberators and at him as a liberator. But these things are not taught to us. Why? Because we've been living for more than a hundred years under oppressive regimes in the Muslim countries who are oppressors. So they don't want to tell us about how liberty and freedom is highlighted in Islam. Let's talk about equality. When we talk about equality, we need to talk about something called the original sin. If you stop any Christian in the street and you ask him about the original sin, he will probably tell you Adam ate from the forbidden tree. <coughs> and because of that, the sin entered into the world, death entered into the world. And we know the rest of this, this story from a Christian uh, point of view. But in Islam, that's not the original sin. In Islam, the very first sin it's not the sin of Adam. It is the sin of the devil, Satan. When God created Adam, God wanted to announce to all the creation that this creature is a VIP creature. He is given superiority in knowledge. He will be the boss. So Allah ordered the angels and ordered all the creation to bow down for Adam. All of them did except one, Satan. Allah blamed him in the Quran and told him, why didn't you prostrate yourself to the one that I created as I commanded you? Satan said, because I am better than him. You created me from fire and you created him from clay. I am white and he's black. I am European and he's Arab. I am Arab and he's Indian. I am Indian and he is Malay. Isn't it the same? So according to Islamic teachings, the original sin is not a fruit that was eaten from any tree. It is racism. This is the challenge which is facing humanity. If humanity looks at the original sin as racism, it would be much better than what's happening right now. And then God told him, get out from paradise. You cannot act as a racist here. The verse exactly says, you cannot act arrogantly here. But he was not arrogant because he was rich. He was arrogant because of his race. See, according to Islamic teachings, the original sin is racism and racists have no place in paradise. 
This is how Islam dealt with racism. In the last sermon of the Prophet Sallallahu he said, there is no privilege for an Arab on an Arab, nor for a white on a black. You know what? You know that Arabs were so racist too. Arabs used to, yani, Romans were racist. They said, the world is Romans and barbarians. Greeks were racist. The Greeks are, the world is Greeks and barbarians. Arabs, even worse. They said the world is Arabs and Aajim. Aajim. Aajim means if you go to the dictionary, it tells you someone who doesn't speak Arabic. But they call the animals Hayawan Aajim because it doesn't speak. Anything that doesn't speak is Aajim. So they considered their language, the Arabic language, the only language anyone who doesn't speak Arabic is Adam like an animal. To this extent, they were racist. That was neutralized by Islam. Islam came to eradicate all this ignorance. It's a paradigm shift. That's why when you look at what happened in 2008 in uh, the United States, and finally a black president comes through elections, that's a big achievement. Big achievement. But when that happened, I remember that we had a black president in Egypt 40 years ago, for 10 years. And we didn't even realize it, except when Obama came to office. Sadat. Look, who's darker in skin? Sadat or Obama? Sadat was the president of Egypt for 10 years. We didn't even focus on that. Uh, two years ago, we had the, the, the head of SCAF, the head of the military uh, council in Egypt, uh, Colonel uh, Tantawi, he's also black. We were against him, not because he's black, because they are military. So Islam eradicated what? Ignorance, racism. And the Americans focused on, on what? Slavery. So you find uh, Abraham Lincoln signing an act banning slavery. And then what? This is good, by the way. This is good. What he did is very good. But he did not deal with the disease. He dealt with the symptom. Slavery is the symptom of the disease of racism. 100 years after the ban of slavery by the law, still the blacks were unable to sit on the seats of the whites in buses. Still the blacks were unable to enroll in the universities of the whites because they only dealt with the symptom, not with the disease. The disease is racism itself. Back to talk about other values. Self-development. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allah does not change the status of any people until they change their own status. Can you deal with this crying girl? Give her a chocolate or something. So Allah here tells us about the importance of self-development. Change yourself. Al-adl, justice, all these are human values. Allah tells us that the reason why he sent prophets and books with them is to establish justice and uphold justice. Allah says in Surah Al-Hadid, we sent aforetime our messengers with clear signs and we sent with them books and the balance of knowing right from wrong so that people may stand forth in justice. The reason why Allah sent Ibrahim and Noah and Musa and Isa and Muhammad and the Quran and the Injil and the Torah and the Zabur and the Suh, all of this to establish justice. See how important justice is. And Allah said in Surah Hud, your Lord would not destroy any town without cause, if, 
of uh, if its people were acting righteously. Allah will never destroy any people without a cause if its people were righteous, if its people were reformers, even if they are non-Muslims. They can be non-Muslims, but reformers. That's why Ibn Taymiyyah said that Allah would give victory and support to the country that is just, a just community, even if it is Kafir, even if it's an unbeliever. And Allah would destroy a country or a community of Muslims if they are oppressors. Why? Because justice achieves the ultimate goals of the Sharia. Ah. All these values achieve ultimate goals of the Sharia. Ah. For example, if you plan well and you work hard, Allah made the system in this world that your income has to increase. Even if you work in haram, even if you're like smuggling drugs, but you plan well and work hard, your income has to increase. This is the system that Allah has put in this world. Of course, you should work in the halal. But this is the system that Allah has put. Allah sends the rain. And the rain causes the plants to grow. So you can have wheat, you can have corn, but Allah will not make croissant for you. Allah will not make you bread. You have to do your, you have to bake your bread. So you have to work. That's why this will answer now the, what we spoke about in the beginning, why Allah is allowing non-Muslim communities and countries to flourish even though they are non-Muslims. It's because they are closer to the Sharia than us. Even though they don't know anything about the Sharia, they even know anything, everything negative about the Sharia, but they are closer to the ultimate goals of the Sharia. For example, among the ultimate goals of the Sharia is what? To protect wealth to protect money, protect your possessions. Good. Which is better for you? If you're going to pay 3,000 pounds somewhere and buy something. To go with a plastic card and pay, or to take 3,000 pounds cash in your pocket and take the bus and then take the tube and you may lose them, you may get uh, mugged, right? So using this debit card is closer to the ultimate goals of the Sharia than using the cash, right or not? Still people are asking, can I use it? Is it allowed to use it? And you see still some people who are called scholars saying, it's better not to use it. Why are you saying so? It's closer to the Sharia to use this debit card than using the cash because it saves money, it saves situations, it removes the risk of losing your money. So it's closer, of course. And you still find people asking about, is it allowed or not? Allowed what? It's even closer to the Sharia. Ah. This is the issue. The ultimate goals of the Sharia. Ah. Here, for example, if, if uh, yani one of the ultimate goals of the Sharia ah is what? To protect life. And it all starts with people fighting. People don't fight with each other here. I see people and even anything happens in the street, people look at each other like that. They keep like saying, you know, yani swearing at each other, but not one of them touches the other. You should see what happens in Egypt. Fighting and, and, and slapping each other and uh, punching each other and kicking each other. And, uh, and then what happens? Everybody, everyone goes home at the end. But here, this can be a big problem. And the police will come and they will take this. There is law and order. This law and order caused what? That life is more protected here than in a Muslim country. Then this is closer to the ultimate goals of the Sharia, ah, which is to protect life. So again, 
we do not have a problem. We don't have shortage of values as Muslims. We have a problem in how to deal with the values. We have a wealth of values that can cause the development of any society. But we are unable to benefit from it. So, these human values are actually nothing but divine traditions. You remember the divine tradition that we spoke in the beginning? About in the beginning? It is the human values. It's among Allah's traditions that if you have these human values, you will develop, whether you're Muslim or not. Whether you're Muslim or not. At the end, in the hereafter, Allah will hold everyone accountable for how he, who he worshipped, who he took as deity. But here in this life, there's a system. These human values, if you have them and if you live by them, by these values, then you are actually doing nothing more than just falling into the uh, system of Allah that he made. That the divine traditions, among his traditions, that if you have these values, you achieve the goals of the Sharia. When you achieve the goals of the Sharia, you are more successful in this life. That's why it all starts with the verse in the beginning of Surah al uh, of this presentation that وَتِلْكَ الْقُرَىٰ أَهْلَكْنَاهُمْ لَمَّا ظَلَمُوا The former communities we destroyed was when they oppressed. But when? When they appointed time for their destruction. So if we as a community become oppressors, if we don't focus on solving our own problems and wait for others to solve it for us, how many single moms do, you have, do we have in our community? You know, I came here one and a, less than one and a half year ago. I have over 10 cases that I met so far. Single mothers who are on benefits and as soon as the uh, youngest boy becomes five, no more benefits. What are they going to work? Prostitutes? And this community, what is it doing? For them, nothing, leaving them to go to the to to to, to find a way to find their, their living. This is a problem. We call ourselves Muslims. This is not Islam. If we if Islam doesn't become in action, then it just becomes just words that we uh, utter in our prayers. That's not how Allah wants from us. If we are real Muslims, we should do collective work and solve these issues and these problems of our community, and then start solving problems of others too. But we're neither solving others' problems nor our problems. And we call ourselves Muslims. That's why the Prophet ﷺ told us to read this surah every single week. Surah Al-Kahf. Not for the blessings in the surah. If it's about the blessings, he could have told us to choose one surah to read, because all of the Quran is blessing. It's because of these meanings that should be renewed in the life of a believer at least once a week. Jazakumullah khairan, barakallah.